Hello and welcome back to the Shadow Work Library. My name is Jessica DePotzi, and for the next at least 43 shows, I'm going to take you through this series that covers the spectrum of negative patterns in the human experience and how we can transform and transcend them with shadow work. Today, I'm coming to you from Samara, Costa Rica. I've been at the Combo Casita for almost two months now. I first came to do our yearly uh, deep dive into my soul with a wonderful medicine woman here, Nadine Purdy. She's one of the Western world's leading experts and probably the most experienced facilitator of combo, which I've talked about here and there on the show. Um, I'm looking to have her on one of these days. I think that would be amazing. She's also equally experienced in serving daimi, which is a form of ayahuasca, also iboga and bufo. So this is a really special place. I'm so grateful to be here. It's kind of like this black hole of love. I think I'm going to have a hard time leaving. Um, once you step foot onto this center, it's like this portal of compassion and non-judgment, but also strength because people face some of their greatest challenges here. So yeah, I come here every year with my husband and some good friends. And if you listen to my last episode with Anderson Todd, which I loved Anderson Todd, I want to have him back on again too. That's really what we explored more of, altered states and getting in touch with that spiritual realm that underlies all things in a very different way. So if you'd like to know more about that experience, you can just hit me up on Instagram at Jessica Depatsy underscore, that's D-E-P-A-T-I-E underscore. If you follow me there, you can also get notified of when I do monthly shadow work workshops. Now, um, some more updates. I'm apprenticing with her, which is why I've been here for so long. This is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity and something that I've been secretly manifesting for years. And that's also why I've been completely off the radar for the last few months. This is really, really deep work, holding space, learning how to serve the medicine humbly um, and standing strong in my own authority, spiritual authority, learning how to access my intuition and speak to my guides in a whole new way, uh, learning more about benevolent and malevolent forces. Honestly, it's been a trip. I'm going to do another solo show here, hopefully soon, to go through this, this experience in more depth. But till then, I wanted to continue on with the Ring of Humanity series because it's been since December since I put a podcast out and that's terrible. So here we go. This is the shadow of opinion and the gift of farsightedness. Now, in modern society, I feel like I start off too many conversations with in modern society, but okay, it's it's a thing right now. Uh, having opinions is considered to be a very healthy thing. And it's true that they're not inherently unhealthy. It's just that when you start to notice so many flaws with the world, so many flaws with other people, or even with yourself, your dissatisfaction with life begins to um, identify with those opinions and it turns into a belief system. And so if you're feeling very serious, this is a really great show to contemplate because that's the, the disease of opinion. It's seriousness. Now, if you're listening to this and you have strong opinions generally, you might already be objecting to this. You know, why shouldn't I have an opinion? Well, it's not about having an opinion necessarily. It's about being trapped by your opinion or being a victim of your opinion. It's like when you hear people say, and I say this all the time, this is just my opinion. It kind of feels like a cage-like belief, right? When you say it, it's just my opinion, it kind of creates this bubble of, well, that's what it is. So our opinions can begin to limit us and define us, but we have to remember that it's not who we are because we can change them at any moment. But I do think that people forget that. You know, I forget it myself because the strongest opinions become meshed in the worldview that forms around really these difficult experiences from earlier childhood experiences, and those can become a reality. So often our opinions are built around these insecurities, and you can build a whole life around that. So just keep in mind that if you're feeling turned off by this, the intellectual mind is a defensive mind. It has an investment in feeling safe in its opinion, and that might be a thing for you. You know, if you are here to overcome the limitations of your mind, this is what this show is about. Now, opinion is formed by this comparison, right? So early in our lives, um, Richard Rudd says that in the first seven years of our lives specifically, opinions are built up around a single projection. And then we turn these little molehills into mountain ranges. You know, we find a flaw and we compare it to something that we hold is better. This could be this flaw about 
how people are in general. It could be about a specific person or a specific type of people. It could be about ourselves. And once that flaw is discovered, it becomes the seed of an entire worldview and a really dense story is built up in our minds. And the triple underlined word here in my notes or words in my notes is our minds, right? This is our intellectual capacity. And specifically, I want to talk about that left hemisphere and overemphasizing that, overemphasizing making the logical intellectual view of the basis of our realities and our right brains being kind of left underdeveloped. Now, I've talked about left brain, right brain a little bit on some other episode, but I really wanted to dive into this topic because I find it really interesting and I came across a new book that I think is one of the most important books I've read in a while, which I'll get into in a second. We're kind of at this point where people don't like to talk about left brain, right brain anymore because, well, the concept of this was, it gained a lot of popularity in the 60s with Roger Sperry's split brain experiments, where he literally cut through the corpus callosums of monkeys and humans. It's this thing that connects both of your hemispheres which I hope those patients were well compensated because that sounds really intense. And since then, they found that some of the popular theories that were created around that are not true. Things like language, all of language is only in the left left hemisphere. Or it's also not true as of what we know now, which always change changes, uh, that visual imagery is only on the right side. So people just stop talking about it because it's just, you know, got a little confusing. But there was this observation that Dr. Ian McGilchrist couldn't get past. It's this, when you look at the brain, it's so obviously split into two things, you know? When you look at it, there's two parts stuck together. And in McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, the divided brain and the making of the Western world, he was really interested in that question and wanted to know, okay, what is going on with those two parts of the brain? It was a very thin little membrane that keeps them connected. And also that corpus callosum, its purpose, and hang in there with me because, I mean, I'm not a huge science person, is to keep those two parts of the brain from communicating with each other. So I think it's people with schizophrenia, or, you know, I'm not even going to get into that. But some kind of personality dis- disorder, this is a procedure that was done to prevent that from, to really keep those two parts from speaking to each other. Because I guess there was some kind of like malfunction with the corpus callosum. So anyway, he was interested in what is going on with these two parts of the brain. And his example in his book is a really great way to understand this. You know, imagine a bird trying to eat a seed and the seed is lying in the ground next to some pebbles or sand that's about the same size as the seed. So the bird needs to be able to accurately focus and grasp and peck so it eats that seed and doesn't get a full beak of sand. But to stay alive, it also needs to keep a different kind of attention open to be aware of predators or other birds trying to eat it or whatever, the wind. And I'm actually not sure what experiments he performed. If you're interested, you can get the book, which I'll link to in the show notes. But he says that it seems that birds, animals, humans, we use our left hemispheres for narrow focused attention to focus on something we already know is of importance. And the right hemisphere is that vigilant attention or consciousness that that's broadly aware of whatever might be without any commitment towards what that might be. The right hemisphere also helps us make connections with the rest of the world. So it's used to bond with mates and things like that. So for humans, he says that we, like animals, use our right brains for this sustained, broad, open alertness and our left brains for narrow, sharply focused attention. But the difference in us than most animals that I'm aware of is our frontal lobe that has the role of inhibition. It's that part of us that can stop the immediate from happening. It's our Um, it's our less primal side, I guess you could say. It's not to say that our primal side is inherently bad. It's just that's what the frontal lobe has been developed to do. You know, we can stand back from the immediacy of the experience. We can read other people's intentions and contemplate them. We can manipulate situations. We can empathize. Most of us have this ability to create this distance from the world and stand back and make judgments in ways that most animals can't, at least not in the way that we would. And so this distance from the immediate is a very human thing. 
we can interact with the world and use it for our benefit. We can use tools. And so for both reason and imagination, which is necessary to be a fully functioning human, you need these two hemispheres. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. The world of the left hemisphere is void of abstraction. So it gives us clarity and that power to manipulate things that are known and fixed and isolated and decontextualized. And so this left hemisphere world, if we were to just look through that lens, strives for a kind of perfection, but it's also occurring in a closed and empty system. And the world of the right hemisphere would be one of individuality. So it's contrary, it's changing and it's evolving, it's interconnected, it's holistic, it's about living beings where nothing is really graspable and completely known. It's like the spiritual realm. And so he says that our brains offer us these two versions of reality that we can combine in different ways all the time. We rely on certain things to manipulate the world and we also though need this broad understanding of the unknowable from our right hemisphere. And this theory, which I do subscribe to as well, is that in the history of Western culture, we probably started off with a great balance of these hemispheres. But starting in the 14th or 15th century in Europe, we developed more and more of our left hemisphere point of view. And this isn't in the book. This is just something Jeff had brought up. But the date lines up with the invention of the printing press. So that might be a thing there. I'm not really sure. But today, we're really left brain dominant, which has our right brain, our intuition, our ability to see the interconnectedness of all things. It's a little undeveloped or underdeveloped. And the result of that is that our modern societies are built on the shadow. We've categorized humanity into boxes, into countries, into religions and hierarchies based on that left brain view of wanting to know what's what's real, what's here, what needs to be organized. And so almost every aspect of our society is based on that kind of division and Vulcan-like logic, um, which includes this comparison and opinion. And so with this limited way of perceiving reality, it's like we pursue happiness in silos without considering the whole. And that results to, um, it leads to resentment and unhappiness, which has created this explosion of mental illnesses. We pursue freedom. We're th- we think we do, but we're constantly being um, monitored and censored and subjected to this network of very small and complicated rules that they're so small and complicated that we just pretend don't exist. And that kind of strangles the freedom that we have as a birthright in a bit of a sneaky way. And I mean, really, it's getting less and less sneaky as the months go on, really. <laughs> We have more information than we know what to do with, but less opportunities to actually use it to gain wisdom and life experiences. And it causes a kind of a kind of psychosis where we can see all of these flaws, but we have little capacity to do anything about it. So we just Netflix the discomfort away. You know, we we prioritize the virtual over the real. And science, which is this amazing tool of discovery, has become this new god figure. And this need to control our lives has turned into a kind of paranoia. So McGilchrist believes that this happened because first off, well, he wrote this book, I think years ago, I don't, it's not a new book by any means. So it's very topical with today's situation. But um, this is, yeah, it's just a really important book that was written at a time where I'm sure it still made sense. But he says that it happened first off because the left hemisphere is very convincing. It shaves off everything that it doesn't find uh, fits into the known. It's very vocal on its own behalf because the right hemisphere can't really construct a solid argument about what's like unknowable and all of that. And just by being human, the known is safer than the unknown. So this creates this echo chamber in our heads that just reflects back to us more of what we know about what we know about what we know. And he also goes on to say that, of course, reason and logic is important. It's just that there is a need to return to this broader context and stop living like we have right hemisphere brain damage. It reminds me of a quote Einstein once, well, okay, I don't really know who said what, but Einstein is thought to have said it. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And McGilchrist notes that 
we've created a society that really honors that servant but has forgotten the gift. So as we dive deeper into the shadow of opinion, you can see that dilemma. Opinion creates division. Oh, some construction going on. Sorry about that. Opinion creates this division because it's based on seeing and challenging these narrow aspects of the whole rather than the whole itself. And this is about the intellectual capacity of our brains being really dominant and through existing in a reality that's built on left brain preferences. It's hard to access our magical and mystical holistic sides. They're underdeveloped and they're compensated for by just like the life we were born into, the world we were born into. And so we make decisions based on the strength of what the left brain is telling us is important without regard for the long-term effects that we can't totally understand. So there's a lot of action before contemplation and insight happening more and more where we can see a lot of short-sighted decisions make, being made. This is not just governments. This is happening in our own homes. Now, like all of the shadows we embrace on the show, there is absolutely a, a purpose, a good purpose to this aspect of ourselves. Opinion causes dissatisfaction, but dissatisfaction ultimately drives humanity towards the next stage of our evolution. And what I'm talking about specifically is a time when the ancient yogis predict will have us finally seeing the perfection and beauty of our oneness with all existence. I subscribe to that too. I really do. If you want to learn more about this great, it's called The Great Mutation, you can check out the 55th Gene Key in Richard Rudd's book. He's also, <clears throat> he's also going to talk about it in our documentary that is going to be hopefully released by summer of 2022 called Post Traumatic Growth. If you wanted to look at what we're doing with that, you can go to posttraumaticgrowth.film. And of course, you know, not all opinion is harmful. I'll just say it again. Healthy expressions of opinion are rooted in something different, though. It's playfulness that comes from having this equally developed right hemisphere of the brain so that the inner structure that we're working with, and I know that our, our process is much more than just brain, but that's what we're going to focus on today. If the right brain is providing that backdrop to the whole picture, it becomes impossible for the left brain to become that OCD on any one element. And to wrap up why this is all perfect, despite the crunchiness of it, dissatisfaction is divine in nature. It's that force that's here to challenge everything that goes against nature and the collective, which is why it ultimately drives us to create this better world. So dissatisfaction really has a place for us. Now, the ways that it manifests itself, if you're more of a repressive or shame pattern person, meaning if the way that you experience fear is inwardly towards yourself, it's through being self-critical. This is comparing yourself to others and really siding with them over yourself. If you're self-critical to the point of undermining yourself, and mind you, mostly this happens and we're not even aware of it because it's lodged so deeply into the unconscious. If you don't hold enough self-value that you can't even hold an opinion or much less express it, this is a really, really good shadow to contemplate. It's knowing and accepting that maybe for a while you've been lacking some backbone and not having the capacity to stand up for yourself or to even have a thought that's different than other people and really like plant your flag in it for a bit. See how that feels. And it could be rooted in not having a real sense of who you are. And that pattern here is accumulating um, evidence throughout your life that supports, like you're collecting data to support this unconscious belief that your life has little value when it comes down to it. It has less value than others. Now, on the flip side, if you're more of a reactive person where your fear is projected outwards more than inwards, and you're more of a blame rather than shame person, opinion can be understood as anything that requires a defense to uphold. So you create this impressive system of your own dogma. And it probably took lots of research and lots of brain power and lots of, honestly, like coming from a good place, but it turns into your own dogma. And at the same time, you're just as repulsed by the dogma of others. These kinds of people are very rational, very logical, very smart. And they use that as a means to enforce their own opinions into the world. So they have a lot of power and influence. And it's really highlighting for themselves and by role modeling for others through simply action or maybe verbally, who is right and who is wrong. It's a very polarity kind of driven manifestation of a shadow. 
And it's fed by this unconscious anger and this unconscious rage, which is why they're ultimately victims of their own judgments. And so if this sounds like you, it really requires looking into your fears, like looking at it straight in the face, embracing your rage, um, in order to move into that magical place where you can see the entire orchestra at play. Sometimes things just need to play out. So all that's to say, I think we should move into the gift of what this shadow transforms into, which is farsightedness. I love this gift so much. The archetypal image for opinion, farsightedness, omniscience is the eye, like the, the third eye, the all-seeing eye. So immediately with that imagery, you can see that it's about how we see the world or more than that, how we think about the world. And my teacher often says that a problem recognized is a problem half solved. Contemplate, you know, that question, I mean, you can contemplate that question, but a good one to contemplate with this shadow is who am I without my opinions? Who am I without my worldviews? And you can also think back to your life 14 through 21, look at the opinions you formed around the world. I'll give you one of mine for an example. I believe I came out of that phase of life with the belief that I'm only lovable if I hide if I hide my dark sides. I didn't know that that's what I was creating, but as I in recent years have been pulling my story apart, yeah, it was a hard pill to swallow. I became very aware of all the relationships that I sabotaged and people that I hurt, especially hurting myself. And it was honestly hard to be really honest with myself that I even had dark sides. The role that I had in my family growing up was the peacemaker. Uh, I think a lot of people listening might be resonating with that. It, I felt that what made me different, unique, lovable, purposeful was my ability to be grounded and in a chaotic situation. Now, my family dynamic was actually not that complicated, but, you know, just typical family stuff. And so by labeling myself unconsciously as the peacemaker and as the referee, this cool, calm, and collected person, I completely ignored the confusion, the sadness, the anger that naturally comes up as a teenager, and I suppressed them with all of the sex and alcohol. I was what you would call a classic hot mess. And I got really good at compartmentalizing my life. I'm a good girl. I'm a good person. And then I have this little part of me, this hidden side that was this wild child that came out at night. And then she started to come out more and more frequently. And honestly, it was really confusing. I had no idea where it came from. And it took years and a really hard purging of people who didn't understand that as I was then working on integrating this part of myself, that I was revealing a truer me. And I finally got to the point to where my darkness is really appreciated, as appreciated as my lightness. Um, I mean, my whole life is dedicated to that now. And I have so many remarkable people in my life that really see me without all of the ribbons and bows. And that feels really good. Feels like exactly what I wish for and more. I remember being so hungover and just that anxiety of living a life that's just not right. I was in my little Long Beach apartment wishing I could just one day be myself and like, why do I keep doing this to myself? And with that memory, every once in a while, I'll look back at my life and be like, oh my God, I'm so stoked that this actually happened. So most of you listening don't really know me. I share some stories here every once in a while. I wish you did see me in my teen years and early 20s. If I can figure this out, you absolutely can too. You know, my belief has changed. I'm just as lovable and it really didn't take that much time. It just took a real honest approach at shadow work. So yeah, I am just lovable now. That's it, especially when I'm rooted in my sense of self. But we have to see it to let go of it. We can't sidestep it. And the answer isn't always what we want it to be. You know, I tried to sidestep it a lot. Like most of my life, I wanted my wild child to just die. I wanted to be love and light and goodness, but it was only through compassion and recognition. And we'll bring that love and light towards this repressed version of myself. That was the only thing that helped. I also realized that that part of myself had gifts that were crying out to be expressed and that I could integrate her into my reality in a really integral way. And in that, my life also doesn't look very normal. That's another challenging aspect of being who you are. You're not going to be normal. And I hope that more and more people do this kind of work and start to have less normal lives because it's more fun like that. You know, having an attraction 
again, I'll make it about me. (laughs) Having this attraction to the dark sides of human nature has me in this situation here, apprenticing to learn about the most powerful mind altering medicines in the world. And there's a lot of deep underworld stuff that's associated with that. It has my relationship with my husband and a lot of my friends looking super different than most committed relationships and most friendships. And people wouldn't, wouldn't like people just aren't always going to understand that, right? And that brings us back to the shadow of opinion. Out of context, when seen in a silo and when seen with just what's known, it's weird and it's easy to brush off as just not correct. But as a whole and in its flow, um, it makes perfect sense. So we use the shadow of opinion to dig into those place of, places of our minds where we feel we need to defend a viewpoint. You know, like I can defend my way of life, but who is that benefiting? Nobody's mind is going to be changed when I come to a, situ- a conversation with that kind of energy. All I can do is let my heart sing. And if somebody wants to listen, then then that's that. You know, I've tried. Uh, tried isn't the right word. I have... Um, gone into both sides and I'm living in a point right now where at least this part of my life I'm feeling very confident that it doesn't need to be overexplained. Now on that Richard Rudd says that we need to understand something fully before we can transcend it. That's what genius is really about. You learn something and then you unlearn it and then you transcend it. So um, in a business context let's say you are starting a new business You need to learn how to run a business. So you learn the way the box has always been created and then you unlearn it by trying it out and finding what works and what doesn't work for you. And you have to undo a lot of the systems that you created that were best practices. And then you do that for enough years and then you finally transcend it. It becomes beyond technique. It's just in your bones that you know what to do. So the transcendence includes all of that, but it goes beyond that. So like understanding it in your bones, when you come across another person, you don't need to fight with them. You don't need to react. You can simply let them have their process and not try to convert them because again, you won't be able to convert them anyway. People have their own path to follow and force only pushes people away quicker, but you can kill people with kindness. The opinionated person doesn't really know how to stay in their energy when they're coming across this kind of loving intelligence when you let your heart sing with your truth, but you're not trying to convert. And that's the difference between power and force. It's non-attachment. You can care without caring. So the gift of farsightedness is seeing this matrix with all of its detail. And once you wake up to that, you really can't go back to opinion and division. It's like this merging of opposites and rising up to a higher level of functioning. And being able to perceive truth through your whole body. So it's like your whole body becomes your third eye that can see where we've come from. We can see where we're going and can have a a nice root in the present moment. People with the gift of farsightedness have this ability to do amazing, amazing things, as you can imagine, because it favors the left brain approach, right? So we're not demonizing the left brain. It is here for a reason. It's super amazing. Um, But it's also about having that well-developed right brain. So People with this gift see the patterns and architecture of existence. They know how to look past politics. They know how to get people working together that you don't need to, you don't really get anywhere for battling and jockeying position. And you can in some hierarchical hierarchical circumstances, but getting to the top that way, always, it's a long fall from that kind of grace when you're built on the backs of others. So you can make things happen through affirming Working with synarchy, listening. My gosh, learning how to listen, having discerning empathy. And this isn't hippy dippy stuff. This is efficiency. It's about working with higher values. Left brain genius is all about mastering technique and transcending technique. And Rudd gives this great example in the 64 ways that a a left brain musical genius works very differently than a right brain musical genius. A left brain works in hierarchies and sequences like Bach, and right brain works illogically in quantum leaps like Brahms. I put a few examples of both of their work in the resources of the show notes so you can listen to what that sounds like. Either way, they both get to the same place of learning a technique, unlearning a technique, and then transcending that technique. That technique, it just comes from a different place. So this is about letting your heart open 
to see through the veil of the world and seeing through that kind of mind. And it creates this kind of creative revolution. Let your heart open wide and then look at the world. And at that point, you can see the true purpose of the gift of farsightedness, which is to serve and uphold integrity and to challenge all misrepresentations of truth in the world. The very quality, and this is similar to all of the shadows and gifts, the very quality that leads to the poo, you know, like that leads to the narrow mindedness at the shadow frequency has this mission to create open mindedness at the gift frequency. I mean, you can see how awesome the superpower is, right? These people can see how to restructure a new paradigm that'll serve humanity instead of dividing it. They can create these amazing community networks. And if this resonates for you and feels super alive for you, then you probably hold a fractal part of the overall puzzle of evolving humanity because it's through foresight that the various aspects of future reality are going to be constructed in a way where we really honor diversity as unity and we can get out of this weirdness. So, yeah, I think that's about it. On the next episode of Shadow Work Library, we're going to continue on with the Ring of Humanity and dive into the shadow of control and the gift of true authority. So if you have a tendency to be overly submissive or on the flip side, you have an acute need for control, like you're kind of a control freak, this is going to be a great show for you. All right, that's it for me. I'm going to get back to the medicines for a bit. Uh, Be on the lookout for my episode also where I dive into everything we do here. I think you'll really like it. Have a great week, everybody. Stay safe, but not too safe. And we will talk again soon. Oh, and before I forget, if you'd like to leave a rating and review, that would be amazing. All right, enjoy your week.